welcome to the intro to the Houdini SDF Modeler, or SDFM for short. So what is SDFM? It's an SDF modeling tool set for Houdini. I will go into a second what SDF actually means. It's implemented using Houdini volumes and it's free and open source. So what is an SDF? Probably a good idea to understand that, at least to some degree. So let's say we have a 3D sphere that we want to represent in a 3D space. Traditionally, uh, in computer graphics, you would use polygons. Now, SDFs are not polygons. They work very differently. So SDF stands for sine distance field. And so what it is, it's a function that basically tells you how far any point in space is away from the surface of an object. Uh, let's say we sample these different points. In each one of those points, you would get a value back on how far the distance to the surface is. Now that seems like making things unnecessarily complicated, but this allows us to do some cool stuff, which I'm gonna go into in a second. So in this case, we're using Houdini volumes to actually save these values. And so each voxel has a value written to it that represents the, the sine distance field. On the inside, they're negative, and on the outside of the object, they're positive. Here's like a 3D view of what that looks like. And as you can see, this creates this gradient. So in this case, the cool tones are negative and the warm tones are positive. Now, when it comes to creating primitives, so these like basic shapes, like spheres, boxes, pyramids, and a bunch of other ones, there's kind of two ways to go about. One, you could, uh, take a normal polygon primitive and convert it to a SDF volume. But what's actually much faster and more efficient is to use these SDF math primitives, or they're just called SDF primitives in the SDFM toolkit. And they use basic math functions to create the primitives. Besides them being much faster and more efficient, the cool thing is also that because they're created by a function, um, they're resolution independent. So no matter how detailed your volume is and how many voxels it has, it will always look as crisp as it can. While a polygon primitive, if the resolution is higher, than like the density of the surface, you would start seeing like the faceting of the different faces of the polygon primitive. So you would have to subdivide your model many, many times, which of course would also have some effect on performance. While well, the SDF math primitives should always look great. If you're intimidated by what I just shared, uh, don't worry about it. You don't really have to understand it or interact with it to use the SDFM modeler. I just figured it might be interesting to know how things work under the hood. So let's talk about the benefits of SDF modeling. Because we're using these sine distance fields, we can do some pretty cool stuff just using some simple mathematical functions under the hood that we couldn't do with just normal polygon geometry. The first thing is that we can do effortless booleans. Uh, because we're manipulating voxels here and not surface geometry, booleans just work. You don't really have to worry about fixing topology and fixing edges or the boolean not resolving. It should really just work every time without any problems. We have these extremely powerful transition effects or functions that also work really well. And again, you don't have to worry about topology, which is just so cool when you're used to normal Boolean polygon modeling. Finally, it's 100% non-destructive. You always have access to the source shapes that you're working with. You can always tweak the transitions. You can tweak the order of the operations. And so you never have to like commit to a shape because you can always go back and tweak it. Here's some examples of stuff I made while developing the STF modeler. And none of these are super amazing, but maybe they'll give you some ideas uh, of what's possible. Now, in my experience, the stuff that makes the most sense are yeah, these solid shapes, but you can also use it for more organic stuff. So in this case, the, on the left side, we have a, a polygon model that's converted into an SDF and then copied and blended together. On the right side, I think I did actually use the SDF primitives or the math shape to create this. <laughs> It's not an amazing character, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what's possible. So we talked about the benefits, but let's also talk about what it's not good for. For one, it's not good for big models with small model detail. I say model detail because you could always go back and you know scatter this detail after the fact or use texture maps. And that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about if you're trying to do it all in one SDF volume, because to keep the kind of resolution to show that detail, you would work with huge voxel numbers, which would be really, really slow. It's also not very good with very thin or skinny elements. Because again, it uses voxels, those can quickly get lost unless you have a super high resolution, which again will be poor performance. It really excels as, as a big solid shapes. When it comes to small skinny stuff, it's probably not the way to go. Also, when you need clean topology, at least straight out of the box, again, SDFs are not the way to go because they're volumes and when you convert them, they basically rasterize this grid. Now you can optimize the geometry and um, I will make some tutorials on some tips and tricks there, but you're never gonna get clean quads and you're generally gonna have a similar topology like this. So if you need clean edges and a good edge flow, this is not the way to go. However, you could concept an SDF and then go into normal polygon modeler or retopologize it and get what you need to. It's definitely possible. You can think of it more as like sculpting in terms of the topology that you will get out of it. Finally, if you have a potato PC, 
This is also not for you, unfortunately, because it's using Houdini volumes running on the CPU. Things can get slow on higher resolutions. And so um, really it's gonna depend on how good your CPU is, how well this will run. So if you have an older PC, older laptop, probably not gonna have the best experience. You can still do it, but you're gonna have to work at lower resolutions and it's gonna take longer to bake out a high resolution. Might not be for you if you have a slow CPU. To summarize it, I think a good way of describing the Houdini SDF modeler is sculpting in volumes using geometric shapes and and transitions. All right, enough on this intro presentation. Let's jump into Houdini and I'm gonna show you some of the basics of actually using it. All right, so in Houdini, we're gonna drop down new GeoNode. And then assuming you correctly installed the SDFM toolset, if we click tab and start typing SDFM, you should see a bunch of different options here. The first two that we'll start with is the SDFM Prim node and the SDFM Assembler. These are kind of our bread and butter nodes that we will use all the time. So if you plug the SDFM Prim node into the Assembler and you select the Assembler, you will see something happening here. Now, you will see that this is kind of a low resolution pixelated situation here. And so you can actually, under the SDFM Assembler, you can, under voxel count, you can change the voxel count to something a little better. Uh, however, keep in mind, um, generally when working an SDFM modeler, you wanna work under low resolution and then only uh, select the high resolution when you're ready to export or you want to have a high quality preview. So let's start in the SDFM primitive node here. Um, this node uh, uses the math primitives under the hood uh, that are much faster and more efficient than polygons that are converted. So to cycle through the available primitive types, under here primitive type we can select uh, different ones. So we got a few here. Um, so let's start with a sphere maybe. And let's start scaling it. And uh, first I wanna go into the UI controls. So all of the SCFM primitives are controlled by this box gizmo. And it might seem weird that I would choose that, uh, but it's actually quite functional once you understand some of the shortcuts. And I wanna go into this real quick. So um, first of all, here's a little lock radius option. So if I turn that off, you will see that um, the sphere will deform to actually fit this box. And so that's actually quite useful. And if you lock the radius, then it will stick to the uh, biggest possible primitive that will fit into the box. And so if you want to like scale it uniformly, you can actually just hold shift uh, and control, and then it will scale the whole thing uniformly. Um, let's switch to, switch to a tube here and the tube does something similar. It will kind of like find the a fitting position that fits into the box. If you select this corner right here, um, you could just move it along one plane, uh, the same for all the other sides. So it's really not nice to know these. Again, if we turn off lock radius, you can see that it actually fits in this box. And so that's why I chose this method is because it's uh, the easiest to implement. Uh, it's the same gizmo for all the options and it functions pretty good once you know these little shortcut. So shift will drag it from the center uh, and shift and control will sh scale it proportionally from the center and control will scale it proportionally from the corner. And so uh, once you know that, uh, it's pretty pretty nice to use actually. Okay, so let's build a little example here. So let's start with a sphere, control shift drag to scale it uniformly. And I'm gonna just duplicate this, plug it into the SDFM assembler and switch this to a box. And let's move this up a little bit, okay? I'm gonna shift drag on this corner to scale it uniformly along that plane. And then um, where it really gets fun is when we start playing with these combined settings. So um, if I just change the radius on this chamfer, you can see that the chamfer starts appearing um, where those two intersect. Uh, we can change this to some of the other methods here, uh, but we can also change the mode. So let's do intersect, for example, and now it will just uh, intersect between two shapes um, or difference and cut away from the sphere. And I kind of like how that looks. So let's say, uh, let's copy that uh, again. Let's move that one down to cut the bottom off. And so we kind of have a cool kind of shape here. Let's add a tube. Uh, let's set that to union. There's some, there's some really interesting here ones too. Uh, under other, you should definitely check those out. Um, offset is one of my favorites. Uh, can be very helpful. Um, it kind of just creates an offset wherever these, uh, these shapes overlap, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, what you should also check out are these shape settings. Um, they vary a little bit from shape to shape. Some, some of them will have this edge option where you can add like a chamfer or a bevel to the actual shape itself, not just the intersection. Um, so that's a, nice to use um, when, when it's there. Obviously a, a sphere wouldn't have that because a sphere wouldn't have an edge to, um, to bevel. Uh, you can also, it also has like an option to taper, um, which is pretty cool. And uh, we also have the option to do a shell. And so this uh, is, 
the easiest to see if you use something like difference. So if I select shell, you can see that it basically now gave thickness to the wall instead of it being a solid object. And you can also do this with, with all the different uh, primitives. Okay, let's add another tube here. Uh, let's set this to union. Uh, let's make this smaller. And maybe let's move this out here. So let's say we want to have this uh, primitive uh, kind of duplicate it around the outside. So for that, we drop down SDFM prim array. And uh, currently it's set to directional total, which means it's kind of in one direction. Uh, you can add, you know, change the numbers of copies that show up in between. You can also change it to directional individual, which uses this offset as uh, each for each instead of the total of all the copies. Um, well, let's use the radial total, okay? Um, let's actually put this back into the center. And as you can see, we already have uh, what we're looking for here in the radial array around the center. And you can move the center around, you can see how the array responds, uh, which is pretty cool. We can also change this total degrees amount if we don't want it to copy all the way around. Say we just want to do minus 180. Cool, and everything still 100% procedural, which is awesome. Uh, it gives us so much flexibility. The other modifier that exists is uh, the STFM prim mirror, uh, which is exactly what you think it is. It's just a, a mirror basically for the primitives. Let's uh, remove that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little about the assembler node. Um, for one thing, if you wanna see what's actually going on under the hood, um, obviously you can select these individual shapes and you can kind of see some of what's going on, but you can also under the assembler, under other settings, show, click show primitive guides, and then you can actually see the shapes that are kind of doing their work. One other thing to note is that while they're all plugged into this assembler at the moment, um, you totally could just plug these all into a merge node and then uh, bring them in here and it works just the same. Uh, so you can also group certain elements into separate merge nodes, for example, um, and control them that way and uh, that might make things easier. You can also just uh, transform stuff with just a normal transform node uh, and that works just fine. Other things to note, for one, obviously the voxel count I kind of mentioned, um, but this is uh, where you will really uh, see the quality difference. Uh, when the resolution mode is to set to voxel count, it will kind of keep the same voxel count. So if, you, if I middle click here, you can see there's a total of about 1 million voxels. No, no matter how big the total like working space is. Now you can also change it to voxel size. And if I do that, now you actually have um, now you'll actually have consistent quality. Generally, I would recommend while you're working to use voxel count. If you want to export and want to keep consistent resolution, feel free to use voxel size. Uh, what we also have is this working region section. So if I actually select this the SDFM assembler, you can see that there's also a box and it normally doesn't do anything. But if I enable the working region, it will clip um, everything to this box, which reason for that is so that you can focus on one area uh, no matter how big your total mesh is. So as you can see, if I move this around, um, it doesn't really affect the quality until I uh, turn the working region off again. This lets you hone in on a certain area and have the like um, all of your resolution focused here, have the best performance, um, and then when you're done, you can just turn it off again. Uh, yeah, you can also hit this fit working region button, and this will automatically fit it to what's inside of your mesh at the moment. One thing to note with certain functions, especially under under other like for example pipe, if you really push the boundaries here, you can see that they start clipping. Even if I turn the working region off here, they, uh, they clip. The reason why is because it actually calculates the shape based on these meshes inside, but it can't really take into account uh, the functions that, it, that push the volume outwards. What you can do in those cases is uh, under bound, increase your bounding region, and um, that will help. So one thing that I find pretty exciting is uh, that this SDFM assembler node actually has two outputs. Um, the first one puts out the volume as you can see it, but the second one, if we select a null here, um, you can see that it actually outputs the, the shapes that were put in. And what that means is that we can actually reuse this output uh, and put it into another assembler and it will recalculate the mesh. So that, make, that means we can take the output of this assembler, put it into another assembler and put our final output resolution, for example, or one much higher. And that way we can work using this one instead of having to change this voxel count every time. Or if we have, uh, if we want to prepare it for final out output, we can already set up the whole workflow to um, create the final output. Um, and we just uh, can toggle between the resolutions depending on which assembler node we have visible here. The other thing that's super cool, and I'm not really sure that there's any other SDF modeling tool out there that can do this, is that we can actually reuse these assemblies and combine them in a new assembler. 
Let's drop down another assembler here. Let's take another STFM prim. Let's up the resolution here to something like 5 million. And then let's actually switch these around. <clears throat> let's make this nice and big. Move it down. As you can see, now we get um, a transition with the whole mesh. Might even be more obvious if we turn this into a difference. Uh, and you can see that the whole mesh is actually cutting out here. Um, We can also drop down a transform node to uh, move this assembly around. I'm not sure that this is something that any other SDFM modeler can do, is to basically use these assemblies as one shape and uh, combine them with other things, and not individually, but together. So this is a really exciting feature for me that could be pretty powerful in the right situations. Now let's say you have a model that you're happy with. Currently, obviously, this is a volume. So let's convert this into a mesh. So uh, let's drop down an assembler. Um, let's set this to a higher resolution that's maybe more appropriate for an output. Let's work with 25 million for right now. And let's drop down the SDFM volume to mesh node. Now let's plug that into the first output. And as you can see now, we have a mesh coming out of this. There's some extra options here that we can use like smoothing uh, or even segmenting pieces that will automatically um, detect separate pieces and create separate meshes for that but I will go into the whole meshing workflow in a different video. One other thing I noticed as I've been working more with this is that sometimes you might actually prefer the preview of the polygon mesh instead of the kind of like pixelated nature of the volume. And so you can totally drop down a volume to mesh node, uh, keep it stock to keep things fast, but you can totally keep that enabled as you move things around and have your live preview be the, the polygon mesh versus the, the volume. And in, in many situations that might be a, a nicer to look at uh, experience. One other thing to think about is that uh, it can be tempting to throw everything into one big SDFM assembly uh, because of these sub assemblies, but uh, in terms of performance, if they don't need to interact with each other, it's much better to convert it all into a mesh and then work with them afterwards as polygons. So like for example, if I wanted to make a long array of these I'd be much better off doing that with polygons and maybe even pack primitives. They definitely don't fall into the trap of trying to do it all in one assembly. If you can split things up into separate meshes, definitely go for that. You're going to have a much better time. Now this video wouldn't be complete if I didn't at least mention uh, the SDFM mesh primitive and the SDFM volume primitive nodes. I won't really go into detail, but basically what those let you do is use uh, normal polygon meshes or SDF volumes or VDBs. Um, in your assemblies. Just note that they're gonna be a lot slower and not as performant when you use them, but there's definitely a place for them and uh, they allow some really amazing flexibility uh, and uh, shapes that uh, wouldn't be possible just using the normal primitives. That being said, uh, if you can stick to the normal primitives, they're gonna be a lot faster and much more fun to work with. I will do another video on the mesh and volume primitive though and go a little bit more into detail there. One other node I wanted to mention is the SDFM properties node. This is kind of a, a random node, um, but it can be useful in some cases. It kind of lets you pull from an upstream and change some of, it, some of its settings to reuse it. So let's say taking these outer shapes and let's say I want to like, I don't know, maybe move them around. Let me just, uh, just do that again. Maybe let's say I want to move them upwards, or maybe I want to actually change them to instead of it being a union setting, it's a difference. And that will let me do that. It also has this one setting called offset, and this actually lets you offset its shape, kind of like an extrude or something like that would do with polygons. And so this can also be useful, especially when you're combining or reusing shapes to make some more advanced uh, type stuff. You can also add a shell after the fact, which can be useful. All right, that was the general intro. I will make some other videos, for example, on post-processing, because there's ways to actually get the mesh quite a bit cleaner, more performant, and get some sharper edges. And then if I bring out other tools or other nodes, I will also make updates on those. But hopefully this will get you started. Please let me know if you have any questions or if there's anything that's hard to understand. I'd be happy to help. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy the SDFM toolset.